Uh, we've arrived at number six, the waning of the Middle Ages, the plague in its aftermath. The, the phrase, the waning of the Middle Ages, is actually the name of a famous book by uh, the uh, Dutch historian Johan Heisinger from around the World War I period, who put his take, volunteered his narrative for this period that we're studying as the waning of the Middle Ages. Uh, I'm probably going to refer to it as other things, but here we go. So just to get us off on the right foot, here's a map of the lay of the land uh, circa 1300 to 1350. Uh, I wanted to give us a sense of what was going on in the, in the political environment before we move into uh, the issues that I really want to deal with more directly. So we have France and England, the 13th century Albigensian Crusade, uh, as we mentioned last week, allowed France to consolidate its control over most of Provence. So we see finally in the map uh, the, the, uh, the purplish block of the French monarchical control uh, has moved into the south. There's Gascony and Aquitaine are, are still part of English control at this point, point the old Norman kingdom. But that was going to change fairly soon, as we'll see. The Hundred Years' War, when this region is being contested between the English and the French, and the war extends from oh, 1337 to 1453. And indeed, if we had uh, more time in this course, we would have been able to introduce characters like Joan of Arc and, and the various monarchs who were contending. Uh, but suffer it as something that will have to pass as simply a little more chaos introduced into our period, along with the fallout from the economic crisis and the Black Death, wars between England and France going on in Western Europe for a century. In Spain, if we look at the map, the Reconquista has reduced Muslim control to the Emirate of Granada, and if I blow the map up here, uh, Cordoba has been lost by this point. Castile has bitten off, or Castile and Navarre as, as a unit, have bitten off the bulk of Spain. Um, Aragon controls the Northeast. Portugal has emerged as its own entity. And uh, the Aragonese, those Spaniards have extended control, as we will see, over Sardinia and Sicily. We'll get there in a second. In fact, here is the second. Between 1250 and 1350, southern Italy was finally divided. Under, under the Norman hegemony, it had been a unification of Naples and Sicily. But in this century, uh, two larger European powers, the uh, French Angevin dynasty controls the kingdom of Naples. And you still get a cast in the harbor of Naples called Maschio Angioino, the Angevin uh, castle or fortress. And Sicily, which is under Spanish control. And actually, this begins the period of the uh, the most debilitating time for Sicily. In the hands of the Arabs particularly, and then uh, the Norman, Arabo-Norman dynasty, Sicily had flourished and was something of a garden spot. The economic rape, if you will, of Sicily was really under the Aragonese, who just treated it as um, an import market. They introduced large-scale agriculture without crop rotation and the like, and burnt out central Sicily. If you travel through it now, 
you see these, these nearly desert conditions on the sides of the mountains of central Sicily. And this was, would not have been the case a thousand years ago. So we can thank the Aragonese for that. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire has not changed that much. It remains the grand assemblage of rival princedoms and duchies with an elected emperor. And you can see it controls all of what we would call Germany and into uh, Czechoslovakia and parts of Poland, down into Italy. Uh, Venice is independent still. Uh, it controls southeastern France. And, and big chunks of what will be Alsace-Lorraine at this point in time. So Western Europe has begun to take the shape that uh, we come to know it as in the modern period. So whatever was the case when we entered the High Middle Ages, it certainly has begun to, to shake out into what we now would consider a recognizable map from the standpoint of the 21st century. Byzantium, after the catastrophe of the Fourth Crusade, when it was uh, really sacked by the Latin West, led by uh, the Venetians, uh, and the 13th century arrival of the Ottoman Turks, now who displaced the Seljuk Turks, uh, very little, if I go back and enlarge the map, very little of what had been the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, this little vestigial unit, a little bit on the, on the Peloponnese um, in the Southeast, a little bit on uh, the mainland uh, is left. Really the, the Turkish Peninsula what we think of as modern Turkey is already being largely controlled by uh, the Turks and will continue to be so for the next, uh, well, to the modern age, and they will be a power to deal with uh, for the next three, four, five hundred years. Uh, the Byzantine Empire will not, Constantinople proper will not fall until the mid 15th century. It's on its last legs now. But the walls finally get breached in 1453. And then for about a half century, there is a small presence. They build a little walled mountain town on the slope of a hill in, in Mistra in the Peloponnese. And that's the last vestige of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, in the 15th century. We see that the uh, Serbian tribes are in place, uh, largely where we expect to find them. Uh, Croats will carve a section out of Bosnia and Serbia. Later on, Bulgaria is in place. Wallachia and Moldavia are separate places at this point. Hungary has a big footprint the Magyars have, have uh, met their match in attacking and fighting and settling for territory or territorial borders with the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but they are in what place where they will be found centuries later. The Muslim world, I don't show the map here, but the Muslim world, Politically fragmented, culturally united. North Africa, if I were to show a map from North Africa here, would be a crazy quilt of dynasties. The Ottoman Turks control Anatolia, and they are Sunnis. They threaten the Slavs, and indeed, Turks and Slavs will go at it for quite a period of time. Mongols will arrive from Asia and, and, and do so in this period. Uh, they are newly converted to Islam themselves. They've taken Baghdad. So the, the Mughal Empire of, of uh, India is a Mongol branch that, that has arrived with the Khans. 
and will dominate uh, northern India for the next several centuries, as well as dominating Baghdad, uh, where they've taken over from the Abbasids. They control vast Asian territories. And in Eastern Europe, as I mentioned, after a brief visitation from the Mongol Genghis Khan, who, at whose death uh, the Mongols just go home to elect a new Khan, uh, Slavs and Magyars have settled into Europe for the duration. So we begin to see what we would call the early modern European map uh, take shape at last. In trade, trade and demography, in this late medieval period, Mediterranean trade had been transformed by the Latin kingdoms in the Levant. So, so uh, Venice and Genoa, you see Venice in the blue lines over here. If we look at this trade map and this odd uh, reddish color uh, is uh, Genoa. And then they move into the Black Sea. So they're, they're trading with the Rus, they're trading with Turks, they're trading in the Levant. And still, until you get to the Portuguese and Spanish navigators making it around the Horn of Africa, until you get to Vasco da Gama and Magellan, and of course, Christopher Columbus trying to do the same thing by going in the opposite direction. Until you get to those people, trade is still going to be a Mediterranean dominated uh, province. What you'll see in the next historical period following this period is that uh, the economic center of the world will move from Italy to the coast of Western Europe, where large navies get built, even, and by groups even as small as the Dutch, who will control trade to the Indies and start importing all sorts of things, uh, from nutmeg to spices from, uh, and silks from the Indies. And remember, the ocean routes, where they finally got around the Horn of Africa, there's no Suez Canal in this period. The ocean route is still many times faster than an overland route, even a short overland route. So even if you traverse uh, some of the Arab land to then connect to the Indian Ocean, so if you went to the east, sail to the Eastern Mediterranean, did caravans to the edge of the Indian Ocean and picked up ships again, that little stretch of going overland made the journey far longer than getting around the Horn of Africa. So the Hanseatic League of Northern Europe finally in this later period, whoop, I lost where I was, I want to do this. The, in black, the Hansa League, uh, ship routes connecting all of the North Sea and, and, and the Arctic, connect to London and to Bruges, where they are met by Venetian and Genoa shippers and, and are then brought into the pan-European trade market. Uh, so Northern Europe in this later high period uh, has joined the, uh, the market society that was dominated uh, by the Mediterranean powers. Banking has developed and evolved, expanded trade, the consolidation of national entities and the cost of, and this is a big one, the cost of evolving war technology the development of infantry. I'll talk about this in the next slide. Uh, required immense amounts of borrowing. To fund the Hundred Years' War, the English and French monarchies needed the, the wealth of huge banking concerns on the continent. In both the Holy Roman Empire and in Italy, and and. Built, began to build their own banking networks. 
to borrow vast amounts of wealth at, at really insane interest rates to fund the wars. And we'll talk about why war needed such funding in the next slide. From a, the year 1000, so all through the 11th century, all the way to the beginning of the 14th century, and I, sh and I show density maps here, uh, population growth continued at a very steady expansion. So if you look, going from yellow to red, the number uh, of inhabitants per square kilometer, you see how the key trade areas in particular of Italy uh, into France and England uh, developed concentrated populations, not so much in Spain, not nearly as much in the Holy Roman Empire. But if you, if you see Italy going from this orangey uh, 15 to 20 inhabitants per square kilometer up to 40 to 50 by the time we get to the year 1300, all in a couple of centuries. And, and this is, I'm, I'm setting you up here, essentially, and, and talking of this vast economic expansion that fueled what we've been calling the high Middle Ages and this renaissance of, of art and, and thought and religious innovation, uh, setting you up for what is about to occur in the 14th century, which is going to be something of a reversal for all of this. So roles as a result of this development, social roles are in transition. Feudalism, which had been the principle of social organization for several centuries at this point, began to be displaced by uh, the new society forming in urban areas, largely. For centuries, the social function of aristocrats was to be those who fight. The fin their financial support of the aristocrats was derived from fiefs they received for providing that service, that military service. And so feudalism rested on dual pillars. One, the manorial economy, and the role, and two, the role of mounted knights in medieval warfare. But by the 14th century, by the time we cross the line into, by the, certainly by the mid 14th century, both of these pillars had been dramatically altered. The manorial economy was no longer the dominant economy. Remember, the, the economy of the manor was all goods used by the population on the extended manor, the interlocking set of farms, uh, all goods consumed by them were developed by them, were grown by them and provided by themselves. This, with very little going to, to external markets, suddenly you have outside markets dominating and, and you're in a market world. As to the role of the mounted knight, a huge transition and the technology of warfare. So first of all, the equipping the well-turned-out knight, if you look at this little visual I've created here, the expense became enormous. So you see 1066, you see a Norman knight covered in chain mail, and then you see the elaboration of plate armor until by the time you get to the 1500s past our period, plate armor still exists, knights still exist, but this is not armor constructed for fighting. Not even in the 1400s was it constructed for fighting. This is purely ceremonial. This is what rich guys did in a world that did not yet have Bugattis and, and Bentleys to show off um, the wealth of that class. You got somebody to build you a suit of plate armor that you could have fed a small village for for probably two decades. Um, new technologies 
were relatively cheaper and changed the face of warfare. So instead of having to pay for a group of well-turned-out knights, which A, would have been incredibly expensive, and B, impossible to maintain. You could certainly not maintain them as a standing army. That's why, that's why in the earlier period, they were given fiefs. You only called them when they were needed. Otherwise, they were supposed to supply their own needs. But now with, in this era of, of constant warfare, if you will, and warfare involving nation states, a new scale of warfare, it was cheaper to arm infantrymen. It was cheaper to arm pikemen. It was certainly cheaper to, to train and develop bowmen, both crossbows and longbows. The English longbow, which makes its famous legendary appearances at battles like Crecy, which I have a picture of uh, in the middle of the slide. They were more effective and less expensive. The soldier, the unit of warfare, instead of being a knight whose entire life was organized around military training, could be a peasant or urban worker trained at, in a lower level, a lower skill level of operation and turned out in great numbers for the same amount of money. That's the good news. Warfare in one sense got cheaper. The bad news is nation states at war required massive armies and suddenly instead of you know when when uh william the conqueror arrived in 1066 he came with something like four thousand knights now we'll see armies in places like crecy of 15 20 30 40 50 000 men moving to the continent and it was and it was going to grow from there because on the horizon not yet in, in the mid 14th century, but on the horizon was gunpowder. And the implications that gunpowder had both for armor and for defensive fortifications. And I show here a, a, uh, a manuscript depiction of an early cannon so from 1327, the European cannon, the vaso, like a vase, if you will. Put the fire there, hope it doesn't blow up in your face, and send a ball out the other side. This was going to be uh, developed to the point that certainly by the time the armies of the Pope Julius II in 1500 are in the field, uh, fortresses, you didn't need siege engines. You could just blow holes in the wall. You took your time. And finally, it was cheaper to use mercenaries. Professional soldiers who you could, uh, basically the 14th century equivalent of consultants. You didn't have to pay them a salary with benefits. You could just pay them a fee for when they were needed and send them home when not. Uh, and the armies used were increasingly, especially in the Italian city-state wars, were increasingly armies of mercenaries, people like Cesare Borgia in the later period. Um, the condottieri of, of Italian warfare. If we look at this manuscript depiction of the Battle of Crecy, this is from uh, Foissart's Chronicles, we see longbowmen, uh, we see crossbowmen on, on the French side. Uh, we see pikes in the background. And there'll be, there'll be many fewer armed knights. You'll see more people fighting from the, uh, their feet, not on horseback, as we move forward. And this, this has a huge transitional effect on social relations, and which I will mention in this slide. So one effect of increased population growth, urbanization, 
trade expansion was the advent of a cash economy. The feudal system had depended on obligatory services as the basis of economic exchange. You do this for me, I provide uh, farm goods for you. The peasant and the Lord had their deal uh, written into the fabric of feudal society. But by 1300, the new market economy had gradually shifted towards wages and rents. So I, I really can't use half a ton of cucumbers right now, uh, but why don't you pay me an annual rent? And we'll try to increasingly move this towards pieces of silver or coined money. Uh, and hopefully the uh, currency won't be debased, won't be stepped on as the drug lords like to refer to it. Um, and that was going to increasingly be the case, which turns the landowning aristocracy, the nobles, into a rentier class. They are now living on rents. Their social function was decreasingly that of military service. And so in conjunction with the new chivalric ethos that had become the subject matter of the chanson, the subject matter of, of, of courtly poetry, they begin in this period to turn themselves in from uh, a military strongman role in their world into a social world that is distinguished not by the power of their right arm, but by their gentility. Distinctions are suddenly based on blood, family, rank. As you go back to the ninth century, your, your claim over your followers was simply, I'm stronger than you. And I have more men in my gefolga. I've got more, more, more men in, in my clique, more, more men in my gang, if you might call me Tatos, as we had called it in, in, in the last course. And it was, it was purely a definition of power. And if my son, who is to inherit from me, cannot... Uh, cut the mustard. Well, he's out. This is there. There, there is only ascribed authority, only earned authority. There's no inherited authority. It's in this period that the chivalric ethos suddenly became one of whose family you belong to, what rank was achieved who was granted honors by the king, uh, that, that what bloodline you descended from, uh, social distinctions that had nothing to do with what you did in the world. You were distinguished by who you were suddenly. And I use this uh, print from the Book of Hours of the Duke de Berry, um, just to create the sense of suddenly clothes make the man and the lady and manners make the man and the lady and the ability to, to rhyme poetry made the man and the lady. This is the, the chivalric world as it was going to emerge and as it was going to descend all the way into the late 18th century, when you find people like the French saying at the end of the century, this is a class that does nothing. We don't need them. They do not have a social role other than to collect rents and to bleed us dry. And, and the desire just to reorganize the legal structures of the world 
uh, move to the front of the line powerfully. In our period, many laws will be passed to assert the superiority of the aristocracy because that social class wanted to protect itself. It realized it did not have uh, a utilitarian justification anymore. Now on to other, to other ways of distinguishing ourselves and making ourselves different and special. And the market economy serfs gradually became small independent farmers with the popular, that certainly in the West, feudalism and serfdom still existed in Eastern Europe much longer. In Russia, serfdom doesn't get abolished until 1825. With the population boom, many uh, give up the farm altogether and became uh, wage earners in towns. The market economy had broken down feudal localism, created a world of complexity and interdependence, but again, the downside. It was subject to the boom and bust cycle. All market economies depend on supply and demand, and where you are in that cycle creates winners and losers at, at any point along the curve. Um, and the beginnings of that kind of, of modern social organization that we think of as the economy are in place. So I have a um, graphic at the bottom. Somebody's, ah, that's interesting. Laurie has um, pointed out that discussions of class identity, I don't know whether anybody's ever read Isabel Wilkerson, the former New York Times reporter's book on caste um, that was just published this past year, an excellent read. And indeed, CAS is about social distinctions that have no basis in and justifiable reality. Anyhow, this graphic at the bottom is a fresco that you can find in Siena. You know, when you're in the Campo in Siena, the Palazzo Publico, that, that the city hall that's at the bottom of the Campo, where the Palio is run every year. There are a series of frescoes in, in one of the main rooms, and this and they're allegorical. They're by Ambrogio Lorenzetti. Uh, this is from the the total series is called the Allegory of Good and Bad Government, and this particular panel of the frescoes is called the Effects of Good Government in the City. And if we look at it, what you see, of course, is besides the muses holding hands, showing you how harmonious uh, the world is, you have people uh, plying their trades, exchanging goods, buying and selling, merchants moving in, merchants moving out, people working in construction. It's the healthy economy. And what does it depend on? It depends on good government. And so the civic leaders... Remember, Siena was a republic in this period. The civic leaders should be reminded that, that running a tight ship creates uh, fair access for all the people involved. And a vibrant economy raises all boats. All boats, right? There aren't, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not winners and losers. The, the understanding was that in an urban world, as opposed to the feudal world, in a feudal world, I'm going to send my knights over. There are winners and losers. I take your territory, you take my territory. This is one that's trade dependent. Uh, it's not a zero sum game. The better I do, the better you do, the better everybody does. So the busy market and trade activity Good government will sustain the economic equilibrium necessary for prosperity. Now, what's been going on? Well, population has been rising to the point of overpopulation. So, so the period from 1100 to 1300 saw so the expansion of population settlement and the colonization 
of what had been frontier land. As populations grow, people ever look, do you, do you know the way uh, as people started moving from in the 20th century, from urban centers to the suburbs, the suburban sprawl kept moving further and further out until commuting distance became, you know, the Poconos kind of thing, or Suffolk County on Long Island. And population will push into affordable areas. In the affordable areas, they were often not uh, the choice areas. People were often having to retrieve and improve uh, marshland. There was a lot of forest uh, deforestation going on as people tried to build farms wherever they went. Think of the, uh, the Americas in the 16th and 17th centuries, North America, as the, as the English settlers push into Western Massachusetts and the like. It was sustainable between 1100 and 1300 because of uh, the so-called medieval warm period. There was a climate, uh, I'm gonna show you a chart on this on a later slide. There was a, a, a temperature bump up that improved growing seasons, the length of growing seasons. So farms were able to produce more. There was greater political stability. Towns, emerging nation states with bureaucracies and law provided for less local disruption, less being taken advantage of by a local warlord, uh, which always improved the economic conditions for everybody else in the vicinity, and improved technology. There, there were tremendous uh, technological breakthroughs in the period, water wheels, heavy plows, advancements in metallurgy for, for farm equipment. During the period of expansion, land was available, labor was in demand, and wages increased. If you wanted, as, as people built up businesses in these new towns, if you wanted to attract more workers, you had to make sure that they stayed happy because they had their, their choice of places they could migrate to. Rural lords and growing towns both wanted to attract manpower in this expansion period. And so we see that the population in millions in, in Europe was, these are all estimates, of course, but about 56 million in the year 1000, 62 million, up 10% by 1100, up virtually another 10% by 1200, up about seven to eight percent by 1250, and by 1300 up uh, another eight percent. So, so really, uh, 15, 16, 17 percent in the century between 1200 and 1300, until we're at this kind of high water mark of 78, 79 million in 1300, and. Consequently, there was an inflation that began to take place. Overpopulation drives competition for resources. Money was a fixed economy, a commodity, excuse me, that did not expand as quickly as population. Uh, there was a limited amount of silver, which is basically what they were using. Although the mechanisms of warfare were less expensive, the expanding nation states began to fight wars on a massive an extremely costly scale, and that drove up the cost of all kinds of stuff. To finance his constant dynastic wars, Philip IV of France, between 1285, 1314, he was the king, began a system of regular taxation. And we can see the prices in England in this chart of wheat and barley really start spiking around 1300. And there'll be a crash between 1300 and 1350. And then because of the Black Death, which occurs more or less around 1350, another spike. And we'll talk about this. This is the shillings per whatever the unit is of, of um, wheat that's for sale here. So we arrive at 
what's really the topic uh, whoop, for this class, uh, which is the crisis of the late Middle Ages. And, and first of all, I had mentioned the medieval warm period, and you see this temperature chart uh, by century, and you see that in the pink block, you're in what was called the uh, medieval warm period, but from 1300 to about 1800, temperatures drop a few degrees, and you're in a long spell called uh, by historians the Little Ice Age, the LIA. Now remember, we are still largely in subsistence economy. That means that surplus wealth is defined, which is defined as that above what is required to feed and sustain the population that has produced that is, is a much smaller percentage, what, what in the modern world we would call productivity, is, is a small percentage of everything that gets produced, largely every all work expended in the economy almost all is needed to provide subsistence for the population uh, supporting that economy any little glitch anything that threatens the production of the food that is needed grain livestock whatever was going to put a dent and, and create a crisis in that world. And what happens is that there was this dramatic cooling, growing seasons were shortened, limiting the production of grain and livestock, and the expansion of arable land that had been going on for a couple of centuries peters out. The low hanging fruit had been exhausted. The good land, the easily recovered land was exhausted. Now, every acre you're going to retrieve for use is going to take a huge increase in work. You're going to have to drain uh, the lowlands of the Netherlands and put up dikes and seawalls at an immense human cost if you're going to retrieve land and keep the Atlantic back, for instance. As a result of general conditions being suddenly turning from good to worse, local conditions in a compact period, so not climactic conditions at a grand scale, but local weather events, flooding, drought, precipitated the grand catastrophe of 1315 to 1370 called the Great Famine. There were three years of severe crop failures and livestock diseases, and it depleted the very thin margins of subsistence food sources. And some areas, sheep and cattle declined by 80%. Food shortages resulted in high rates of malnutrition, disease, crime and death. There were, there were reports in parts of Europe of, of cannibalism during this period. And then, of course, it spun the entire economy into a, a vicious cycle, a downward cycle. Hunger lowered productivity, which lowered food availability, which drove prices up. And back to number one, and around and around we go as the spiral comes down. So in this period, there are a lot of depictions of, of apocalyptic events uh, you get from a manuscript of 1320 over here. The European standard of living on an upward spiral for two centuries came to a crashing halt. And I, I chose this uh, one, I mean, we're gonna see more of this, um, a fresco from a later period, but marking, marking a social or I should say, at this point, a cultural development 
that was going to affect the next 150 years uh, from this point on is that you're going to see depictions among the living of, of skeletons, uh, of images of death. There's going to be this kind of uh, cultural sobriety uh, that is is going to, and and of course it's going to to jive very nicely with the uh, the hellfire and brimstone preaching of the Protestant, proto-Protestant and Protestant reformations when it arrives. Uh, death is right around the corner. Look look to your salvation, and you and and we'll and we're going to see even more paintings in which. People like Francis are are contemplating death and looking at at uh, skulls in their acts of meditation. And then, of course, the Black Death. So suddenly, in thirteen forty seven, a major outbreak of bubonic plague spread from Asia to Europe, carried by fleas from rats. At the time, the cause was thought to be the air, polluted air or miasma, as they call it. This is the so-called second plague pandemic. The first one occurred during the reign of Justinian in the late Roman period and devastated the Mediterranean just, just as badly. Now, this plague isn't entirely going to go away. There's going to be recurrences in Europe. Um, until 1815, if we look at the, the map, you know, it, it gets transmitted along trade routes. So it always begins in port cities. So it comes from Asia and the color coding is a matter of where did it hit first? So we see in Turkey, we see around Dubrovnik and Sicily and the tip of Italy and the ports of Marseille and Genoa. Corsica, Sardinia. Then by 1348, it's all over Spain, it's all over France, it's all over Italy, it's in North Africa. Uh, London by 1349, it just moves in waves. Uh, areas, sections of Poland were relatively unaffected for reasons that nobody quite knows how to understand. Maybe the rats in question had a natural predator or something in that region. I, I never read much about anyone making sense of it. The estimated deaths in Europe in this five, six year period were from 30 to 40% loosely. You'll get outlier estimates as high as 50%. Uh, but conservatively, conservatively, a third of the population, or 25 out of 75 million people. Um, if you think of that in the context of, of what we're doing today, this is, you can, you can imagine how horrific it is. And of course, the mortality rates were uneven. You, we're talking about an average of 33%. The population of England between the wars and the plague between 1350 and 1450, the entire population of England dropped by 50%, dropped in half. And there were sections of Germany of the Holy Roman Empire that were hit for like 60% of the population. Historians speculate that conditions resulting from the Great Famine may have accounted for the staggering mortality. Certainly the weakness of the European diet after the Great Famine um, made people really liable to uh, getting the worst forms of, of the disease. And, and these density charts that I was showing you before, so the last chart on that earlier slide was this one in 1300. And, and you see that, for instance, Italy gets bounced right back to where it had been a couple of centuries earlier in terms of population density, and France and England also. Uh, the, the Flemish and, 
areas, which had been heavily and densely populated, the, the market regions also took a tremendous hit. So if we look at this chart of population growth, you see the constant rise from the year 1000 up till about 13, it begins, there, there, there's that little leveling off in here, the famine, and then plague and, and warfare in, um, among uh, central nation states. And we see that by 1400, it plummeted. And then we see a steady resurgence again, all the way up to uh, mid 17th century until uh, the smallpox outbreak in Europe in the 1660s. And you're back at the bottom. And then you grow like crazy again. And all through the 18th century, there was incredible growth until the 19th century when you see things like typhoid and other plagues hitting places in Europe like Naples, where you have some reversals. So death became a theme in the period. Death and penitence became a theme. And of course, if you take a pietistic art, and we had been talking about the development of personal uh, religion and, and the focus on Christ the person, as opposed to Christ the Godhead, um, by the Christians in Western Europe in this period. Um, now it's further exacerbated by the focus on death and the suffering of Christ. And so art will, especially in Northern Europe, art will focus dramatically on, you'll see these tortured images of, of Christ and his suffering. Um, you will the, the, the Protestant iconography will be filled with that. So coming after a generation after the Great Famine, the scale of the plague left a pious world shattered. Was this a biblical judgment? Was this the portended apocalypse? Was this the end times? Social reactions ranged from guilt to blame. Public acts of penitence, we see flagellants in Tournai or Dornik, as it's known in Dutch, from thir 1349. Um, flagellants marching through the streets, by the way, with have, using veils to help mask themselves when, when they thought they were near contaminated air. But from that's the guilt aspect. But um, to public acts of, of, of blame, the pogroms. Here are Jews in, in, in Flanders, Pirot du Tilt, a Flemish manuscript, um, shows Jews being burned up because they take the blame. This is a visitation on us. Jews poison the wells. We know their, their evil intentions. And left over from a continuation of the crusading spirit um, and anger at in, the infidels that we saw beginning as early as 1096 in the First Crusade. And here we see from the same Antiquitates Flandriae, we see burials, mass burials, people bringing caskets uh, in Tournai to be buried. Grave sites everywhere. This became one of the, the cultural tropes of the time. Um, the preoccupation with death intensified. Christianity became the religion of the crucified. And of course, to purify yourself, if you thought somebody was infected, you went into a prescribed period of social isolation and using the biblical references of 40 days in the desert, 40 years in the desert, Christ going to meditate 40, 40 days and 40 nights, the flood resulting, Noah's flood resulting from 40 days and nights of rain, 
Uh, the Italian word for 40 is quaranta, from which we get quarantine. And, and so uh, we're still using that word, gang. Anyhow, the triumph of death was a theme that you began to see in art. So apocalyptic literature showing death in command, triumphant, indiscriminate, and it becomes commonplace after the plague. Uh, on the lower left, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Albrecht Durer, war, famine, pestilence, and death out ravaging the population. Uh, everyone can be a victim. We have a bishop down here. It's indiscriminate. It's not to be resisted. And the triumph of death, Bruegel the Elder had a, a really um, dour view of the world, as we will see in this and in some other paintings we'll take a peek at. Uh, and then this one, again, here is a king in his raiment. Uh, no one is protected. Death assails everyone. And, and, and the details here, it strikes people at the table. It strikes people it, in their social lives. It, it just ravages the countryside. And, and so you get this sense of... Uh, the world as a place of, of Armageddon. Um, and it's not an enemy. It's not, it's not a foe. It is uh, what God visits upon us. It is, it is death as destiny. And so it, 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 it really contrasts this sense that you'll find everywhere with the fact that, and I'm going to talk about it in a couple of future slides, the fact that this takes place at the same time that we see the buoyancy uh, in the Italian art produced by what is they refer to as the Renaissance in this wonderful juxtaposition. Another product of the crisis is political and social unrest. So the early medieval worldview regarded the social universe as a fixed hierarchy. And so uprisings of any kind were local occurrences. By and large, you were in a fixed universe. The nobles had their status. The, we, the, pe the peasants had their place in the world. It was the great chain of being. In the 14th and 15th centuries, extreme social and economic conditions triggered popular mass movements. The Holy Roman Empire witnessed 60 rebellions in a 200-year period. The most famous of the early ones is the Peasants' Revolt in England uh, in 1381, called uh, Watt Tyler's Rebellion, called many things variously. Um, oh, excuse me one sec. Okay. In the aftermath of the Black Death, a poll tax to pay for the Hundred Years' War triggered an uprising that quickly escalated into a general social rebellion. We will not pay. Rural peasants whipped up by radical preachers, one famous one being John Ball, and here he is rallying the troops. This all comes from Froissart's Chronicles and the, done in the 1390s demanded the abolition of serfdom, and they rampaged through London. Ultimately, the king is forced, Richard II, is forced to go out and, and try to bargain with the rebels, and here he is taking his boat down the Thames to meet the rebel army. There's a rebel army that makes its way into London, and finally, what, what Tyler, the leader of the re rebellion, is killed, and that shows this being done here. <clears throat> 
the rebellion was suppressed, but it helped curtail the war effort with France and left a lingering desire for social equality. The point I want to make here, and I'm going to make it even more strongly um, in our last slide, is when we get there, is that radicalism in religion suddenly becomes tethered to radicalism in politics. They become part of the same ideological framework. And partly because the radical religious movements provide an argument that the individual person is the the unit of sanctity, the unit of the church. It's not some big corporate hierarchical social enterprise, the, the Church of Rome that, that Christ lives through, but through the hearts and, and psychological world of every individual who, who claims to be Christian. The impulse for personal religion, the impulse for social justice took a radical turn. Anti-clericalism, critiques of the church were increasingly joined to a yearning for social and political equality. And one, the, probably the most significant proto-Protestant of uh, the late medieval period was the Englishman, the 14th century Englishman, John Wycliffe, whose followers, the so-called Lollards, he's an Oxford academic, he's a scholar, he's a priest. He's declared a heretic posthumously, but he reprises positions that were first heard in the 11th century, but he makes them aggressive and he formalizes them. Wealth has dec decayed the church and the clergy. The life of Christ should be one of poverty period. The simple vernacular should be used in preaching. The Bible should be translated into English, period. Personal holiness, not some sort of magical priesthood, is worthy of respect. And he adds arguments that are novel, that become the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. The ultimate religious authority is scripture, sola scriptura, not church tradition. The institution of the papacy, the veneration of saints, most sacraments are not justified by scripture. Point out to me in the New Testament where, where this is endorsed, he challenges the church. A belief, and, and he adds to it a belief in the doctrine of election or predestination. If if salvation depends on my receiving the grace of God, as the argument is going to be made, first by Wycliffe and then by several who follow, and God is all-seeing and all-knowing and knows my choice, and God is eternal and unchangeable, that must mean whether I am saved or not is already in a hand of cards that has been dealt. It can't change. I am therefore predestined because God knows where I wind up and his knowing can't waffle. So the argument is going to go from Luther and Calvin, etc., rooted in Wycliffe. And finally, the argument that the entire church hierarchy should submit to temporal, that is, state authority. Let's get these priests out of the middle. We only have an issue of social order on earth. We have a state authority for that. Let's use that. Religion is between you and your God. It's personal. Let's get this this great Satan of an edifice that stands between us and Christ out of the way. And the great 
Czech academic from Bohemia, from Prague, Jan Hus, who is a later generation who picks up Wycliffe's attacks and, and adds them the denunciation, the denunciation of indulgences as, as in a theme that was going to be picked up a century later by Martin Luther. Um, and he gets burned at the stake by the Council of Constance, and, and that's the same council in which Wycliffe is declared a heretic. So religion has begun to radicalize in a way that the church cannot hold on to, it cannot control it. Now, there is a bump of sorts. There is going to be an economic recovery after the plague. All bad things must come to an end. There are a lot of fields going fallow as a result of the agricultural collapse of the 14th century and depopulation. Abandoned fields are allowed to return to forest. So we get reforestation in several areas. Just as if you go hiking in upstate New York, you'll often stumble on, in the middle of the woods, you'll often stumble on farm walls where people had hacked out a farm in the 17th or 18th century that has now quietly returned to Catskill Forest or Adirondack Forest. There's higher productivity, believe it or not, because the labor shortage encouraged a shift from grain production to animal husbandry. There's, there are gonna be more shepherds and cow herds. So wages increase, but so did inflation. There's greater work mobility, diets improve with the greater availability of meat and dairy. So there are some upsides that will develop out of the period. There'll be an eventual end of serfdom in the West. It won't be entirely eliminated for a, a long time, but was largely displaced by the market economy in Western Europe. It persists, like I said, further in, in Eastern Europe. Lower rents, agricultural workers in demand, so better deals, better rental deals, tenure deals, tenure agreements, favoring the peasantry could be hammered out. Land was rented with fixed annual payments. And at the end of the 15th century, as I alluded to earlier, the improvements in navigation will shift the economic center of from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Italy loses its economic dominance to the Atlantic Rim with the ascendance of England, Spain, and Holland. Now, this chart, I forget where I got this from. It shows two time series, two curves. Uh, the red curve, the guy took from Thomas Piketty's book on, on the, the grand wealth gap over uh, the modern period, and 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 Piketty's book, he was pointing how the gap, the share of wealth of the richest ten percent in Europe, fell from ninety percent down to sixty percent between eighteen hundred and nineteen fifty. But ever since then, has been on the rise again, which was Piketty's point, and and the fellow who published this graph provide the time series for the blue curve and what he could make out of the earlier period. And you see that having rich reached a high point of wealth disparity in 1350, after the Black Death, there was a real plummeting of the disparity of and wealth of the richest 10%, and which would then begin to grow again for several centuries into the early modern period which is an interesting graphic. Anyhow, I wanted to end by talking about, for a few slides, that what we've been calling the high middle ages really is a, a period in which you see the, the early expression of both what we call the Renaissance and what we call the Reformation periods. 
And first of all, I want to talk about the medieval roots of the Renaissance and the impact of personal religion and the focus on the appeal of Christ the man and this new focus on the interior life of the individual person that is now part of Christian worship. The inspection of the human personality would contribute to the artistic preoccupations of the Italian Renaissance. So I, I picked this one painting of, of, of Fra Filippo Lippi, The Coronation of the Virgin, done in the 1440s. It, it couples in a nice way the, the double point that I, I wish to make about this period. It is a, in a religious, it's on a religious topic. It's in a powerful religious tradition of devotional worship, but it includes two things. It includes a self-portrait of the painter who's put himself in the middle of, actually in the lower left, but he's made himself a factor in the painting, A, and It's a self that's looking back, if you will, at the camera, at the eye of the viewer, with a calm self-declaration, here I am. This is about traditional devotional themes. This is about religious expression, but I am in this as I am in that world of piety. And he's not alone. If we look more closely, there are several figures looking back at the camera. They are all watching Mary crowned, but they are in it as people who you should know and contend with. Here I am, Hickstow, here I stand. And of course, the roots were not just in the, the pietistic movement, but the Renaissance roots developed from the secular tradition, the humanist tradition, that itself is a product of the high Middle Ages. And it is in two ways, civil institutions have developed like mushrooms in this period. Cities, nations, they need new forms of governance. The legal systems were based on secular traditions, be it Roman law or common law, secular traditions. This was not the case, by the way, in the Muslim world with its reliance on Sharia or religious law. And so, and so the governance of the period was human and used traditions that were rooted in old Roman and old Germanic institutions, human institutions that were secular to the core. And of course, in the 12th and 13th centuries, there was this dramatic revival of translations and of interest in lost classics. Now, it began with uh, classical, philosophical, and medical texts being translated, but it soon expanded to a, an enthusiasm for lost classical texts of every other ilk, all of which are concerned with secular interests. So the need for clerks, and this is why I, I provide these, these um, portraits, these Renaissance portraits at the bottom, because all these people are in either governmental or clerical positions of one kind or another. The need for clerks to staff the expanded commercial enterprises and government enterprises, they found literary models. And by the way, I, I, I chose portraits in which everybody's got a book or a document at hand. 
and the literary models for the prose of these new practical texts of one kind or another, or correspondence texts, letter writing, were Roman writers like Cicero, who is now becoming the rage and, and the, the Renaissance period of, which is the high middle age period in Italy um, of the 14th century. And so here we have money changer family. We have a portrait of a merchant. We have Holbein's portrait, which you by the way can see in the Frick collection at the Met Breuer uh, of Holbein. And we have a magistrate, a man of the law, a doctor of law by uh, Giovanni Battista Moroni in the 16th century. And, and look at these people. They, they are well off, they are educated, they are the products of a secular humanist education and tradition. They are having their portraits painted by people, painters, who recognize the depth, the value, the importance, and the primacy of these individuals and their force of character. This is a world that is about the individual. It isn't, it isn't as if one day a bunch of Italian artists woke up and said, ah, I think we have to change our focus to one of individualism. It was built into what they inherited in religion, in civil institutions, and in classic, and then the great classical revival of the Middle Ages. And medieval roots of the Reformation, personal religion, again, not just as an inspiration to Renaissance art, but as the inspiration to religious reform, the intense focus on the sacrifice of Christ and human unworthiness prompted a re-examination of the church as a worldly institution. The impetus to reform coincided with a move to vernacular preaching and to vernacular devotion. Let's do it in your own language. The pious individual was increasingly empowered so all the elements of the coming radicalism were in place when Luther and Calvin arrived on the scene. Here we have a portrait of Luther by uh, Cranach the Elder in the 1520s. Again, this intense priest. And here as the uh, Victorian period likes to uh, lionize Luther, the man standing as a single individual against the grand institution, the decadent institution. Hickstow, here I stand. More on this merger of radical religion and radical politics. Having rejected the papacy, but fearful of the social disorder that that disruption might trigger, Luther, and other so-called magisterial reformers. These were Protestant reformers who argued that civil magistrates, okay, had authority within the church. That's why they're called magisterial reformers. Um, wanting to still make sure that social order was maintained the argument of Luther and, and others in his camp was that, well, the duties of social control should be taken over by the secular or temporal authorities. That position, of course, though, was soon challenged by the so-called radical reformers, for instance, the Anabaptists of the 16th century, who rejected all secular authority. Every, everything's between, on a radical level, it's about the relationship between me and Christ. 
And at root, that's going to spill over into the political world as well. So in 1524, that early, the great peasants' revolt in Germany, the entire peasantry of all of the Holy Roman Empire goes up in flame. All the radical threads of the 14th century, religious threads, social threads, political threads, are melded into this comprehensive ideology that anticipated every future revolution down to the Russian Revolution. Legitimacy was now supposed to flow bottom up from the individual to the elected leader. You only lead your sovereignty, your legitimacy is based on me, the individual, and us, the group of individuals. The corporatist hierarchical worldview of the Middle Ages, the great chain of being, was now displaced by ideologies that are rooted in and based on a radical individualism. And indeed, in, 16, uh, in the 1640s, in England, uh, the Puritans are going to put a king of England to death. Feudal authority was, was defied. The aristocratic class by the way, with the angry approval of Luther, who pu publishes a number of pamphlets, encouraged the, uh, the local authorities to do this, slaughtered between 100 and 300,000 peasants in Germany in a two-year period. And at the bottom, there are several woodcuts from the period that show this. So the famous, the 12 articles their statement of, of, of independence, the peasant statement of independence. You notice them with pikes, the so-called peasants with pitchforks, if you will. And here they are surrounding a knight to bring him down. And then an insurgent leader, uh, a famous one, Rohrbach, burnt at the stake uh, from a, another print in the period. And then, uh, in our very last slide, again, to return to Bruegel, and again, talking about uh, the, the, the Reformation's roots in the period. He paints three different, I only show two of them here. Bruegel, in the mid-16th century, paints three different images of the Tower of Babel, you know, the old biblical story of the story was the, the, the headstrong king who wanted to build uh, a tower to reach heaven so he could see and rival God. And of course, the angry God of the Old Testament declares that their unity of language will be thrown into disarray and they won't be able to speak the same language and their ability to build will collapse and he throws them into total disarray. And, and it is used here by Bruegel as a kind of um, allegorical presentation for what has now occurred in the world, that there's been this loss of a socially unified and linguistically unified society, that this has been foretold, or maybe even he was a good Protestant predestined by the Bible, the ultimate authority. It's apocalyptic and millennialist in overtone. And, and the events are the result of, of, of human decadence, human sin, pride, presumption. It's that 16th century take on, if you will, the modern condition. And, and, and so we have from that tradition of 
Joachim of Flora, all the way coming down through Bernard of Clairvaux and, and um, Wycliffe, all the way to Luther in the Reformation, this sense that we are the sinning uh, people who brought this disruption, this civic catastrophe down on our own heads. The world will never be the Eden that uh, we were given as an original promise, uh, not until there is another uh, coming of the Redeemer to save us from what we have wrought. So religious piety and that focus on individual responsibility and individual sin has produced this new sensibility, which will go forward and then unite ultimately with emerging market capitalism and become the kind of Protestant possessive individualism of the modern market world that we see around us as we speak. At this point, I'm going to stop the share. I am going to remove my pin and I am going to invite anybody who has a question or comment. Uh, after this, I will mention, after this gets posted, I'm going to have the fellow at the station um, bundle them into a playlist. And then I will send out links to all the playlists uh, on YouTube for all the history classes, not just this one. So anybody who wants to pick up anything that they miss, a single lecture or a whole series or whatever, they can. And this has been fun, as always. You've gotten me through a year of social isolation, gang, for which I thank you. You've given me deadlines. Uh, you've made me produce something so I'm not just a bump on the log, and, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Lou. It's been a, a wonderful thing. And thanks to all. And you've given us a sense of purpose on these two days. Anybody else have uh, any question? Or... Yeah, Lou? Yes. I wanted to recommend everybody reading um, a book I'm just finishing called Kristen Lavron's Daughter, which is a famous Norwegian trilogy. And it so accurately, it takes place in the 14th century in Norway and, and really reflects everything that Lou has been talking about. So you might find it interesting. Thanks. Anyhow, um, okay, gang, next year in Jerusalem, I'll, I'll, I'll be back online sometime in October, apparently. I have no idea what the topic's gonna be, so. Well, thank I'll keep you. I'll, I'll keep thank you, you Lou. Thanks okay, so much. Bye. It's great. Take care. See you later.